You know, with Eric Harland and Steve Wilson, with basically your band, I just have to do Hans. I have to catch <laughs> catch Hans. Oh, Hans! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I'll have the quartet. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I just did an album with a different quartet. Oh, really? I don't you... know if I can. Tour. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I can tour with this quartet, but um, it was. Um, uh, Ambrose Akinusery on trumpet, uh, Brian Blade and Scott Collier. So, oh man, how was that like? It was really great, man. It was really great. We did, although I was a little hard on Ambrose because we had to rehearse. Um, we had to rehearse. Uh, well, I did two gigs um, before the session, so it was two nights. Okay. And okay. Ambrose had to fly in the day of the gig, so we rehearsed that morning, and then we rehearsed before the gig, and then we did two sets, you know, oh, sure. and then two sets yeah. the next night, and then the next two days of full days of recording. So it was kind of difficult on the chops, but he 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 powered through it and and played some beautiful stuff. Oh man, it, was it your music? I mean, you wrote? Yeah, yeah oh. my music. And um, was there any? Oh, we did a version of the, the Kenny Barron tune, The Black Angel, uh -huh. also in Crystal Silence. Oh, wow, beautiful. So, oh, man. So this is coming out like later next, this year or next year or? Probably next year, early next, next year. year so oh, man. My third Mac Avenue album. Yeah. Looking oh, Whew, man, me too. I mean, it's already Scott and Brian. I mean, Brian, he's my favorite drummer. I mean, really. Yeah, yeah a master he's... orchestrator. Yeah. 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 And Scott also, you know, I mean, all, all, all these three guys that you mentioned, so that's just like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, it's all good, man, yeah. So oh. your instrument is guitar, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm a guitarist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I listen to all kinds of music. I, I transcribe lots of stuff. I, I transcribed many of your tunes, like Backwards Bop and some other stuff, mm -hmm. like just, just, just to see, you know. What you do, I love exploring everyone's. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, and you're you composing. Okay? Yeah, yeah, super. Super. Oh, okay. Yeah. And your, your composing is just like always, you know, I listen to acceptance and I try to write down stuff and it's just, you know, it's so heavy rhythmically and melodically and harmonically. It's just. Oh, man. Thank you. Yeah, you know it's how do how do how do I wanted to start with this actually with acceptance by asking you like how do you write music and what's let's say for the quartet like for this small group type you know where do you start like with the rhythm with harmony and melody or it depends I guess or well actually you know I'll start even before that I'll start with what what is the story or what is what's the mood that I'm trying to evoke, you know? And once I, I mean, I guess I'm the kind of composer that needs some sort of story attached to it, some sort of, uh, mm. some sort of thing that it's about. Um, and, and so I'll start with that. And then depending on what that is, it might require that I start out really melodically or start out really harmonically, rhythmically. Yeah depending on, or orchestration or texturally, it depends on um, what I'm, what the story I'm trying to tell. So that's, that's when I'll start. And then I'll, sometimes I'll mess around at the piano um, if I want to come up with a melody. Sometimes I write just straight to music pad if I want to write something contrapuntal or something like that. Uh, it depends. Let's say for Dory. I mean, like, how, how, how did this one come along? It has so much, you know, that came around, that so came around. Happened. actually, I was, there's a song, I don't know the name of the song, but it's an album called My People by Joe Zawinul. Oh yeah, sure. And, and there's one song where he's, I believe Sadif Keita is singing a melody and he's playing it backwards. 
uh, and it's such a the, it's it must have been a beautiful melody forwards but backwards it's really beautiful it has these really unpredictable shapes and twists and turns and I was really captivated by that melody so and it seemed like kind of a diatonic type of melody a melody mm. that was just one key um but really beautifully shaped so i came up with this um melody that seemed to me to be like just based off of like the ionian like just a, a, a major scale uh, mm. you know yeah just some melody like that and then as I was playing it, um, it kind of formulated rhythmically in my mind as a Brazilian, like a samba type thing, you know, um, this, this kind of like really fast moving rhythm, but the melody that was kind of languid that, that, that went over it, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of how it was started. Now I named it Dory, um, but Dory is actually, Dory Kaimi. Kaimi, Dory yeah. Kaimi. Um, but he's actually a guy who writes these beautiful ballads, these long, flowing, romantic type melodies. So when I played it for him, he said, I didn't realize I was so fast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but I was, I was like, you know, I, I have to name something for you because I love you. Yeah, yeah. Now it's beautiful what you what you've done. You know, like it's just the whole album. I mean, acceptance. It's like compositionally, I, I love it. it Thank just, you. Uh, it's you know from melodic stuff to to this Latin. I mean, uh, ha having Eric Harland on drums helps, man. You know, that, yes. That's like and also uh, Rogerio Boccato too. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, I mean that guy is amazing. The one of the most probably the most amazing percussionist I've, I've worked with. He's he's just a, a beautiful player, a very, very in, instinctively does orchestra, brilliant orchestrational stuff with the percussion. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I really love him. Did you guys like talk a lot about music, how to do it? Or I mean, in general, do you do that? Or you just like give, let's say with also with Brian now with Scott and Ambrose, like, or? I really don't I try to um, write a song that it's clear what it's about, you know? Um, and then, you know, with a drummer like Brian or a drummer like Eric, you know, a bass player like Scott or Hans, you know, and Steve or Ambrose or any of them, it's, you don't really need to say much in terms yep. of like, they get the story, you know? And I tried not to interfere with how a person is going to interpret because I, you know, music's a collective thing, and Definitely, yeah. whatever someone else brings to it is welcome, as far as I'm concerned. Definitely, just so yeah. long as it, it's, just so long as it doesn't, you know, like it doesn't become about them, you know, but it becomes about the whole, you know. Yeah, but I mean, all the players you 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 work with, I think that they know what the idea is. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Pretty much, I mean, yeah, th th they, as soon as they play it, I, it's just like, that's, yeah, that's it. That's what I meant, you know. Very few times do I have to give, like, like, it's, and usually it's not instructional, it's more like guiding someone to how I thought the song should go. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Say, oh, okay, and then they you know it just turns into that and if it's and also on my part i'm not looking for something that is exactly what i you know like rigidly heard in my head and has to be replicated exactly like that yeah. um, you know i'm willing to accept that certain things are, are going to go in another direction because it's another individual involved in it. Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, I, I laugh always when I give to a really good drummer a, a tune of mine, what they do with it, you know, because always the drums are like, like, man, how did you come up with this, you know? Like the melody, you know, if a saxophone player it's written out, you know how it sounds. And 
of course he has yeah. that's his personal touch but the drums if it's not written out it's just like okay wow it's... yeah well that's because i think you know with the saxophone and with the piano and with the bass that, that's what it sounds like the saxophone is that sound and the piano is that sound but the drums yeah is like the the bass drum the snare drum the hi-hat the cymbals, the tom, floor toms, the, the, the rack mounted toms. And then you have brushes, you have sticks, you have glass sticks, you have mallets, you know, so there's this variety of sounds. So it's like an orchestra in yeah. and of itself. So, um, so yeah, it's, it, the drums kind of like drive the orchestrational thing of a group, I think. Yeah. You know, comes in the piano too, because the piano sure. kind of, is, is like an orchestra or a guitar if if any harmonic instrument you know yeah i mean you had the chance like i checked my albums with that i have of you and some drummers it's like billy hart jeff dane watts you know eric carland yeah. uh brian blade you mentioned you played like you know with antonio sanchez. antonio sanchez yeah like with the best and it seems to me like drums and rhythm seem to be really important for you and uh yeah, where does this come from i don't know um I, I i i don't know where my ideas rhythmically come from but um i know that there is a very, very visceral and immediate relation that i feel with the drums i feel very connected to the drums but not just the drums as a rhythmic entity also the drums as an orchestrational yeah. entity too um and because i like orchestration you know sure. um and people like those people who, I'm, who we mentioned are master orchestrators and, and there are more there's a young drummer uh christian human who i really love too he plays mm. right now with jacob collier but he also plays with like uh remy labeouf and and oh, really? i have to check him out oh, okay i know pascal labeouf yeah and and He's pretty amazing too. I, I, I would put him on that level also, you know, of drummers who you don't have to really say much of anything, they just get it. Um, and and um, and there's a, you know, there's drummers I haven't played with who I really would love to, like Marcus Gilmore and Bill Stewart. I never- Oh man, that would be a cool one. Woo. Yeah, um, but I've been very fortunate that drummers find that that these level of drummers find my music interesting enough to want to be involved in it, um, and and um, I do write um, stuff that requires a drummer to really understand yep. music from a rhythmic standpoint. Um, but a lot of times when you do that some drummers can think that you wrote the music for them to to play a lot of rhythmic drum stuff on and it's not that um this is this is like i like interesting rhythms that may go over the bar line and may have yep. you know subdivided or have odd meters and stuff like that that doesn't mean that it's a drum uh concerto yeah uh, um and a lot of these drummers understand that you know yeah, I think all these guys are composers also. That helps and yeah. band leaders. And, yeah. you know, Brian Blade has fellowship and, you know. Yeah. Antonio Sanchez. Antonio, yeah. Bad Ombre and, and uh, exactly. the other stuff. And Jeff Watts had his band. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Even Eric Eric had Voyager, I think, and something yeah. else. Yeah. So. Yeah, all of these guys are just, they, they go beyond drums, you know. Yeah. They're just extraordinary musicians as are you know the bass players that are, there's an electric bass player here in los angeles that is like my absolute favorite person on the instrument is jimmy johnson Do you know oh, jimmy oh well, come on. sure yeah, yeah I mean, jimmy johnson is is like one of the greatest musicians that he's know. one of the most underrated bassists i think ever really like yeah i mean musicians I, I, know of him but yeah I yeah. know. That's because he's his personality is the kind that he doesn't like to draw attention to himself, uh, and uh, he doesn't like to to be 
out there in front in the limelight. He's just like quietly, like just does his job making everything sound better, you know, um, which is a true bass player, you know, yeah. like you, you just make everything sound better. And it's, it's like he'll, he can do subtle things that make it sound better. Or he does like flashy things that make it, it's a, it's, but he has a, a great sense of drama too. That's another thing, you know. Um, and, and so, yeah, I can't say enough about him. It, it always bugs him when I, like, I'm, I'll do a gig and I'll say this kind of stuff. And he's just like, hides his face. <laughs> a very humble person, but he's, he's brilliant. He belongs in the conversation with Jocko and with Anthony Jackson, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw you have a gig in August with, with Electric yeah. Group and he's in it, right? Yeah, and uh, Christian Newman and Bob Shepard, who is yeah. like music beautiful. brother for me, you know. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, I'm looking forward to another electric album also when it comes up by you also with this group, hopefully. So Yeah, yeah. It will be fun. Yeah. Yeah, cool. But uh, Billy, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, just going back, what, what, was it also like when you grew up or let's say, uh, I don't know, early 70s, was it also a rhythm that got you attracted to improvisation and jazz? Or what was that trigger, if you remember? Uh, not so much rhythm. Uh, I just loved the fact that if I would listen to a Herbie Hancock solo, it seemed like it was speaking to me in some sort of language, you know, that I could understand. Um, and, uh, and Chick Corea and McCoy Tyne. Um, those were like the three primary main influences on me. Um, and then later came Keith Jarrett and then Bill Evans also. Oh. Um, but yeah, no, that, that didn't, you know, I just liked the fact that it seemed like a language, you know, uh, that people were talking yeah. and, and people were communicating with. And so I liked that, but early on I had, you know, both of my parents were school teachers and I have two older sisters, mm. um, who were also very, Uh, musically inclined and very brilliant and you know I mean, and very eclectic in their taste so I grew up with with this incredible confluence of musical genres that just coming at me you know um, and then uh, when I was 14 uh, I, I discovered Emerson Lake and Palmer oh really oh wow <laughs> Keith Emerson just blew me away he's a now there you're talking about a guy who's uh, well he's I think he's underrated in the sense, I'll put it this way. When I, whenever I talk about Emerson, Lake and Palmer, people are surprised. Uh, and kind of, I'm not saying at present company excluded, but most people have kind of a condescending type of um, attitude about him because of like, it was a very popular music. Act, yeah, movie. sure in the 70s and they would dress up weird like armadillos or something and he'd be stabbing the organ and the piano would be doing he did all of these antics but when strip away all of that and when he just played the piano when he composed it was brilliant it was unbelievable he revolutionized um the synthesizer's role in pop music i mean yeah. he really brought it to the forefront he's like a pioneer of that you know uh And he used a synthesizer as an orchestration yeah. device, not a thing that played the music for you, that, that, which is what happened in the 80s, you know, like getting sequences and sure. start, you know, no, the, the synthesizer with Emerson was an orchestrational device that kind of augmented the music that he already wrote. Yeah. Did you see them live, like in the 70s or ever? Not in the 70s. I saw them later in the 90s. Later. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But, um, but yeah, and so he was a huge influence on me. He's actually, listening to his music is what got me serious about playing piano. Actually. Oh, wow. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, um, that's kind of how I, I, when I was young, I listened to Herbie Hancock. I listened to McCoy Tyne. I love that stuff. But, the, and M. Wandishi was a big one also. But when I... Uh, heard Keith Emerson, I actually said, I want to learn how to do that on piano. And, and then I started taking lessons and, and uh, 
serious about it. Yeah, but it's cool that you got got the wide range. I mean, of, I mean that's that helps in music, right? I mean, I think so. I think yeah, you're kind of the sum total of everything you've heard and experienced, you know. And yeah, nobody is one thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, or nobody interesting is one thing. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you read, you know, all the greats that they were like, they listen to everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think, it's. I think Hindemith loved jazz. I know yeah. Ravel did. Um, uh, and you can hear jazz in Hindemith's music. You can hear jazz in Mathis de Mahler, like in the, the Temptation of St. Anthony, you know, uh, yeah. the climactic part. You can hear jazz. There's a very direct reference to jazz in Ravel's piano concerto in G major, you know, and. You know, William Walton has a lot of jazz stuff in his music. Stravinsky wrote rap. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Band or something like that. They all love jazz. I mean, it's, it's and jazz musicians loved it. I think, uh, I'm not sh sure, um, I mean, I, a Bird loves Stravinsky. Yeah, yeah. And Hindemith, I think also, yeah. I think. He, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Hindemith was a big influence on me. Yeah, he was, I, I love him, yeah. Beautiful music, yeah. Yeah, have yeah. you heard Mathis der Mahler? No. Yeah, that's that's that the Temptation of Saint Anthony is the the, the, the last movement of Mathis der Mahler. The oh, okay. And it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's incredible stuff. I mean, all, all that, and it's so nice that you can you know just like make your own dough out of that, and just like out comes yeah. you in this case. Let's say <laughs> you know that's beautiful. I like that. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, Billy, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, I kind of know what, what was happening after that w Windham Hill Records, when yeah. those came out. But I wanted to ask you before, uh, like, uh, really early on, you started playing with the greats. And I wanted to ask you about two experiences with J.J. Johnson and Freddie Hubbard. Right. And how, how, did, how, how did those gigs actually happen? The, the, you got the gig with JJ, for instance, and immediately flew to Japan and playing with Nat Adderley. At, and... The right place at the right time type of thing. I was 19 when I first started rehearsing with JJ and 20 when we did that album and that tour. Oh. Um, it's kind of an interesting story how I got that gig. So uh, you have to backtrack a little bit. I'm like about 17 or 18. And um, <clears throat> and and um, there's a club in, not so much a club, but kind of a jam session loft place called Onaji's Cultural mm -hmm. Tea House in, in Los Angeles but during like, we're talking about like 1974, 73, 74, 75, right? So um, yeah, I'm about 17 years old and, and uh, Onaji, you know, it was a kind of place where you could walk in it's, he lived there and there was sawdust on the floor and there's a piano there, and he played vibraphone. So there's a vibes there and, and a drum set. And you can just walk in off the street, basically. You could just drive up there and just open the door and he'd be there and he'd say, hey, what's up? And then, and then uh, you'd start playing. And he'd start playing, and it was great, you know. So one day he calls me and says, um, hey, Billy, uh, I have this gig that I want you to make, if you can make it. Can you do it? It's some, a function. Um, and I said, sure. So I go there, and it's a function where Stokely Carmichael is speaking. You know Stokely Carmichael? Mm -hmm. He's like... Um, very, very, um, very influential uh, in in the, the black consciousness movement. Like, oh, okay. you know, a speaker. He was with, um, I think he was with the, the Black Panthers. But I know he was with oh, okay. a, a SNCC, uh, an organization down south. Um, but he was a very deep thinker and a very um, very, um, you know, great speaker and great thinker and philosopher. Uh, 
and he was speaking there. And I was like, wow, you know, he's, he's part of American history, you know. Yeah. Um, and and um, so he's speaking there, and uh, I was, and then the, the drummer in the band was a guy named Kevin. And he and I just hit it off really well, you know, and we became best friends, you know. So after this, you know, I would hang at Kevin's house every day for about a year. I think it was like maybe my first year at USC, right? So, so we're like just hanging. And then one day he says, you know, my dad um, has put together a band um, and he wants to go to Japan. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Japan. Yeah, I've never been there. So he, and so the next day we go over his dad's house and JJ Johnson opens the door. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I said, this is your dad, you know. So then then I was playing with JJ and he liked what he heard. And and Kevin and I and a um this bass player named Tony Dumas, you know, here in Los Angeles, and the three of us went as a rhythm. And then Matt Adderley was on it. So that's how I got that gig. Wow. That's so it's like cultural shock. Um it was cultural shock, um, like being like a no name, nobody student at USC in the composition department. And then the next thing you know, I'm walk I'm getting off of a plane and people are taking pictures and there are programs with my picture in it and people are asking for my autograph. And it was it was crazy. So that was that. And then um, I played uh, I, I took theory lessons um, from a lady named Miss Usler, a Marianne Usler. She kind of changed my life. And uh, Larry Klein, uh, the bass player producer. Mm -hmm. Uh, was also in that theory class. We were both like 16. And we just, again, we hit it off. And, you know, he was an incredible bass player. We we played a lot of Bill Evans and Eddie Gomez tunes. That's when I first started getting into Bill Evans. Bill, yeah. um, and um, so then, you know, I went to USC and he went, you know, to Cal State LA for a minute, but then he started getting gigs. You know, one of the gigs he got was Freddie Hubbard. And Freddie Hubbard back then was doing like a lot of his commercial stuff, like Liquid Love and Windjammer and, and Red all Clay, that stuff. that stuff, yeah. No, not Red Clay. Red Clay is different than Liquid Love and Windjammer. Oh, okay. Number one, Red Clay is on uh, CTI. CTI, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Liquid Love and Windjammer was on Columbia, but those okay. were albums that Freddie wanted to repeat the commercial success of his prior albums like Personal and Red Clay. And it was kind of like badly put together, like kind of commercial music. Uh, but he had a band um, that was actually really quite good. Uh, uh, Larry Klein on bass and Carlos Vega was playing drums. And oh, Rick, oh. Zunigar, Rick Zunigar played guitar and Dave Garfield played piano. Oh, wow. Carl, Carl Randall played sax. So, um, he, he, he had that band, but then those commercial albums weren't doing so well. And then, so he decided to do a straight ahead album, uh, Super Blue, uh, with Kenny Barron, Jack DeJanette, Ron Carter, and Joe Henderson. I think Hubert Laws is also on it. Um, and then he wanted to put a straight ahead band together. So he got rid of everybody except Larry Klein. And Larry said, hey, I know a piano player, um, mm. Billy Charles. So that's how I got that gig. Wow. How was it with Freddie? I mean, I, I've heard many different stories about playing with him and him being a bad le band leader, but how was your experience? My, my experience was, you know, really, I, I cherish my experience. I actually think that I got an education that you could never sure. buy um, from playing with, in my, arguably the best trumpet player in history. In, in my opinion, but, you know, I'm biased. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, certainly technically, oh, what dropped? Oh, okay. Certainly technically, um, the greatest trumpet player um, uh, in, in the bebop mold. You know, well, technically there's Wynton Marcellus, but Freddie, to me, um, has, like, so much, like, bebop language and, yeah. and stuff at his command you know um but anyway so 
Um, I learned, I learned by example with Freddie, you know, as a band leader, he didn't say much. He didn't talk about music in an analytical way. You know, one time he was telling me that I shouldn't play my solos from top to bottom. You know, I start in the middle and then go out. Mm. You know, in other words, shape the solo. Yeah. But for the most part, um, uh, he didn't say much of anything, you know. And in terms of comping, uh, which is one of the key things I learned from him, his only instruction to me verbally was lay out, <laughs> you know. That's it. Um, when he, yeah, and for good reason, you know, I'd be playing all over his solo. And, you know, he exhibited extraordinary patience by just allowing that to go on, you know. Uh, but when he couldn't stand it anymore, he would just say, lay out, you know. <laughs> but sometimes the music didn't require a harmonic thing. Sometimes it was kind of like that Sonny Rollins trio type thing that he was going for. Uh, um, so, you know, uh, I learned, but how can you not learn how to comp when you're comping someone like Freddie Hubbard? I mean, his solos have such interesting and beautiful shapes and so many opportunities to yeah. augment, you know, you know, it's just, it's, it's beautiful, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible that, you, you know, your, your generation got, and some gener maybe one generation later got the chance to play with, you know, still yeah. the original, you know, jazz greats, if I put it like that. So it's like with Art Blakey and all these guys and. Yeah. Yeah. I know like, it was, it was great. I got to play, I mean, not so much play in his band, although he did ask me to play in his band. Um, uh, Art Blakey, that is. But uh, Really? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. But, but I got to play with him many times because since Freddie was in his band, he would always come and sit in. Oh, know? how cool. Man. And I sat in with his band one time, but then Elvin was playing, so that was great. You know? <laughs> um, oh, uh, wow. But but um, yeah, I got to play. It was I'm I'm fortunate that I got to get connected and touched by a lot of those masters. You know, Joe Henderson, Bobby Hutcherson, yeah. uh, Art Farmer, Johnny Griffin. Uh, you know, uh, Matt Adderley, yeah. JJ, uh, Benny Golson. You know, I got to play with a lot of these and. and uh, Ron Carter, Tony Williams, you know, uh, Stanley. Uh, well, when did you play with Tony? Was, uh, I played with him. There was a an album. It's called Pride of Lions. Oh, I don't know this one. Okay. Yeah, I don't. It was some collective thing, and it was Tony Williams. I can't remember the bass player, uh, uh, but me and. There's a Chicago guitar player named Fareed Hawk. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know Fareed. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I have to yeah. Tell you. yeah. And um, I can't remember who else was on it, but it was a Columbia kind of all-star type yeah. thing. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And Tony Williams was a drummer. I was like, man, this is great. <laughs> I played with Tony on a Diane Reeves album with Stanley Clark. But I've, I've never really, I always wanted to play in his band, but he, you know, he had Mulgrew Miller, so I think he covered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, but still, you know, come on. Yeah, it's just the chance to whatever context to play with these yeah. guys. It's just like, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, incredible. Yeah. But uh, me being a guitarist, I wanted to ask about one thing. Uh, we mentioned Jimmy, Jimmy Johnson before, and uh, I cannot go past Alan Holdsworth. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, He's another one who I feel is uh, one of the great ones that I was able to to, to touch. How, how did that connection with Alan begin and happen? I think through Jimmy. Uh, oh. oh, no, no, no. Actually, it was a drummer named Steve Houghton, I think. Yeah. Uh, who who um, first uh, brought me to an audition. Not, not so much an audition, but we played with Alan. It was me, Steve and Jimmy and and Alan. We played in some rehearsal studio like in like Tustin, which is way south of LA. By the way- I wanted to ask you about Alan, you know, being, he's one of my heroes, definitely. And 
and just your experience playing with him especially his compositions and his unique approach of improvising and scales and everything like yeah i never really asked him those technical questions like what is your approach to improv improvising and scales and harmonies and stuff because he he wouldn't he probably couldn't answer yeah because he um because he was um he didn't really read music and he didn't really write music. He actually came up with his own nomenclature, you know, like X's and O's and stuff like that. Um, and so everything he taught me, you know, he taught me and I had to memorize it. You know, that's how it was with everybody. Oh, wow, really? I, I was very, I was very, I, I have to, I'll, I'll say this about myself that I have a very good memory. You know, so when he would teach me that the stuff, I would get it like pretty much immediately. I think I learned his whole book, like a whole show in like two days. Oh wow, uh, man! Okay. Uh, and and then we just went out on the, and then I had it, you know, um, and and uh, so he was always impressed with that. You know, he called me memory man. Actually, <laughs> that's a cool. He was a very, he was, it was like, he was beyond humble. Like he went the other way. Like he, he couldn't, you couldn't tell him that he was great. He would just always refute that. He would say, oh, I sucked. I was, uh, this oh, shit, okay. uh, I just, yeah, I just didn't like what I played. He just never liked what he played. Um, I think one time when he just like everybody's jaw was on the floor and it was undeniable that it was it, it was like a genius performance he said yeah I, I think that was that was pretty good that was okay you know oh. that, that's how it was I mean even he had to say that it was okay, <laughs> yeah. you know? oh, that's man. how it was you know so um but it, it was Again, the same as with Freddie, you didn't really learn by him instructing you. You learned by um, just listening. And I learned a lot harmonically oh, sure. from Alan Holtz, or just the beauty of his voice leading, the perfection of it, you know, uh, the, the, the way that his harmonic, his idea of harmonic progression. Yeah was you know it's very unique and it, it made total sense but it was totally unpredictable yeah yet logical yeah. you know um and i just loved it those were some of the happiest days of my life was playing uh, doing i did two tours with him and those are some of the the, the funnest things that i've ever done mm. yeah i love those things like funnels and looking glass and all that yeah. stuff it's just so cool man it's just like yeah <sighs> really yeah, cool. great i never i regret that i i mean i love chad wackerman's playing but yeah i went i regret that i never got to play this book um live with gary husband you know um i would have loved to explore that I, he, he was his, his drumming on iou is still yeah. some of the drumming you know he's the, the monster connection between him and alan holsworth you know and also on, what is that, R Rakuka or something? I've never known how to pronounce that. Uh, it's on hard hat area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. The guitar solo on that is like, it's unreal. Yeah, I, tra I transcribed so much of his stuff and I came like to, you know, 70% or 80% to just like, did you ever transcribe that one? No, I did like this is the whole album, 16 Man of Tain and uh, Atavakron. Atavakron. Yeah. I did some of that stuff. and But, you know, just at a certain stage, it's just like, yeah, yeah. you know. Just... Yeah, I don't know where he picked up his idea of, of... well, I do. Um, he loved uh, John Coltrane and he also loved Michael Brecker. Yeah. Um, cites those as like main influences on his approach you know 
This Legato is style. Beyond yeah. that, I don't know how he connected the dots to arrive at where where he arrived. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this. But there's this video. Uh, you know when when those guitar instruction videos came out in late '80s, early '90s, and there's one by Alan, and it's so. Oh, really? You have to check. It's like he talks about this system of his, you know, his scales, and and you watch this for one hour, and after one hour, you're even more puzzled than before. I, yeah. It's just like he's like, yeah, I don't know what this is, but like, and then he's just like explaining and explaining, and like it's just like what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think of I mean, some of my favorite guitar players, and I want to get your opinion on this uh, throughout history. The ones that I loved the most were like George Benson, uh, Pat Metheny, Alan Holdsworth, um, who else? Uh, uh, Wes Montgomery, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's some newer people that yeah. I love, you know, also. But I love Julian Lodge. Oh, he's, he's, he's amazing, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the guitar player that I play with a lot, Larry Coons, I love. Oh, sure, yeah. I did this talk with Larry also. It was such a nice guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Peter Sprague is another one who's, mm. who's amazing. Mm. But, um, you know, who are some of your favorites? I think you, you kind of, I mean, Schofield is one of those I would add. And, uh, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. And Abercrombie, John Abercrombie, I loved, I still do. He's, yeah. he's up there. Jim Hall. I mean, I love Jim Hall. Oh, there's another um, out of Chicago. Uh, Jeff uh, Parker? No. No, no. The, 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 uh, Bobby Broom. Oh, man. I love Bobby Broom. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. He's, he's incredible. He's such such a nice guy also, man. Re yeah, really yeah. nice. Yeah, such a nice guy. Really. Yeah. yeah, these are, I mean... Just the guitar history. Grant Green. I love Grant Green always. Grant Green. Also. Yeah. Kenny Burrell, you know. yeah. Oh, I saw the, the other day a sophisticated lady, you and Kenny Burrell on YouTube. Oh, really? Yeah. It's oh, incredible. Man. Yeah. From 19, 1987 or something like that, I think. 87? Is this possible? Uh, it could be. I mean, I've known well, him a long time, but. Well, I don't... Well, I think it's 87. I checked it yesterday. Just 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 a sec. Wow, I was 30 years old. Yeah, 1987. Wow. Oh man. Yeah, I was right. Yeah. Yeah. It's with Cameron Brown and Ralph Peterson. Cameron Brown and Ralph Peterson. Wow. Yeah. You have to check it out. It's quite cool. Yeah, I remember yeah. Cameron Brown, right? Yeah. Amazing. But yeah. the, the, uh, speaking of this '80s, I, I, I mentioned before already the Wyndham Hell Records. Like, how did that story begin of you becoming a band leader, and how do you see, how do you look at those records now? I mean, and listen to them a lot. Like, of course, it's the sound is of the label kind of, but like your tunes are like still, you know, so complex rhythmically, and well, Bob I mean, Shepard plays amazing on it, and you know. Yeah, so does the drummer Michael Baker. You're yeah. talking about underrated. That guy is like should be way out there on the cover of drum magazines. <laughs> uh, but um, and Jimmy Johnson and Tony Dumas were on sure. those. Um, first of all, I I really love the fact that Wyndham Hill took a sh chance on me, you know, and let me do what I want. One thing, my only complaint about it of that period was the fact that um, as a marketing thing, Wyndham Hill represented new age music. I yeah. mean, Wyndham Hill was synonymous with new age music the same way that Blue Note is synonymous with jazz. Yeah. Right? So, and new age back in the day was the, you know, the antithesis of jazz. It's like, like people hated if you said the word new age to a jazz person their blood would blow it's the same thing as saying smooth jazz yeah yeah sure um so the name wyndham hill meant new age so they started a jazz label and if they wanted any credibility they shouldn't have called it wyndham hill jazz 
It's like if Blue Note wanted to start a classical label, yeah. but they insisted on calling it Blue Note Classical. You, you think jazz, yeah. you know? Um, and, and so people like DJs and the critics and the public at large, the perception of, of that was my albums were new age. You know? So, and then you'd hear it and you'd go, oh no, yeah. this, is, this is jazz. And we were trying to put out really vital, hard-hitting jazz. I think we did, yeah. uh, but um, but you know, the, and, and as a result, those albums kind of like faded into obscurity. And like it's a period of my career, a very important period of my career that people don't know about. Um, and I believe it's like the start of my jazz chamber concept because. What yeah. I wanted to do with those groups was treat it like a chamber ensemble. You know, there's a there's a, a song called His April Touch, which is yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. It's, it's basically inspired by it, it was written from after my father died, right? And hmm. the line is from a poem that E. E. Cummings wrote about his father dying. Um, anyway, his April Touch is very complex and very co contrapuntal and very classical in conception, you know? And also on that album is a New World Disorder, which is kind of like modeled after Prokofiev's Seventh Sonata. Mm. Uh, so all of these are like the precursor to me wanting to create a hybrid form of music like jazz and classical. Because on his April Touch and on a New World Disorder, I treated the band as though it were like a string quartet or something. Yeah. Everyone had different parts and everyone, even the drums, you know, it, was, it wasn't like there was a lot of dashes and I didn't get too super specific with the drums, but Michael Baker is another one of those orchestrational geniuses who knew how to Do put it, yeah. in the blanks, you know. Um, and and so, yeah, that was, that was the beginning of that, that, that concept. Uh, was or, or my moon and hill there's like take for example this twilight is a poem yeah. is april touch and portrait of a player portrait of a player was the last one and that was a trio jazz thing yeah it's interesting that the, the, when i first you know starting discovering your jazz and also your music i was like windham hill really and then i listened to it i was like ah okay that's yeah, it, it's different, you know. Well, see, that's that's exactly my point. You yeah, exactly. Yeah, first. you saw the label first, and then and, yeah, and kind of like imagined what it probably would be, and then you were surprised when you actually heard what it was. Yeah, yeah definitely. A lot of people didn't even make that leap. They didn't even go forward to listen to it. They just oh, that went in the middle. <laughs> that's terrible, actually. Yeah, but... yeah. Those, those albums, uh, I'm very proud of those albums. Those are really yeah. Good. Yeah, you should definitely try to still get them out or yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if they're out somewhere. Really. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the practices of these labels is that they, they kind of wait until you're dead and then they, you know, say, oh, okay, yeah, let's let's put it out now. Yeah, <laughs> super. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, uh, after Wyndham Hill, I, I just wanted to ask you about you've done then such a such a huge amount of writing and composing and playing and band leading and uh how did you decide for the groups you know there's like a trio with george Mraz and billy hart i love that album i mean let's just talk about the band but then be prior to that it's like you know dave holland and tane and uh yeah. terence i think and ravi coltrane like how did all these projects happen and how did you decide on the band members actually also and well, with the um, the uh, Bedtime Stories album with George Mraz and Billy Hart, that was a, a Todd Barkin production, actually. Before Todd Barkin was running the Keystone in Baltimore, he was also like the person in charge of jazz at Lincoln Center. Like he was the guy that booked a lot of, most mm. all of them. Uh, the guy now is Jason O'Lane, who was, kind of head artistic director uh, of Link Jazz at Lincoln Center, but before him was Todd Barkin. Um, and Todd also on the side of that was producing a lot of records for Japan. 
So because of Todd, I got to do a lot of amazing things. I got to, I connected with Grover Washington and got to record in Rudy Van Gelder's studio with Rudy Van Gelder, you know, mm. um, no. Washington uh, album. Uh, I also got to record a lot. I recorded on a lot of Joe Locke albums that Todd produced. Yeah. I got, got to play with Eddie Gomez and Al Foster and, and all of these, uh, Gene Jackson was a buddy of mine. And, and, uh, so Todd actually hit on me to do, I wasn't with a label at the time, and he hit on me to do an album uh, of, of music dedicated to Herbie Hancock. It was kind of funded by a Japanese company, but one of their conditions was it had to be kind of like music of Herbie Hancock. Mm. So I said, sure. Um, and he said, yeah, George Moraz and Billy Hart will do it. I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I did it. And, um, you know, that was how that happened. Um, and then, you know, with the other album, The Child Within, that was an album where I was with Shanaki, the Shanaki label, uh, and wh which was also kind of a smooth jazz label, but, they, but their name wasn't synonymous with smooth jazz. Yeah. Uh, it could be anything, so it was fine to put out an album. Um, with them and that you know the budget was such that I could ask the people that I wanted to play with and I always wanted to put together a rhythm section with Dave Holland and Jeff Watts yeah that's and um did those guys ever play together before they probably did not right? not that I know of yeah, yeah. You know, I mean cool. they probably played on something but but not an album yeah on a recording and and um Terrence was you know, who I wanted on drum, I mean, on trumpet, and Steve Wilson, you know, you know, I love Steve Wilson's playing. And so it was, yeah, that was, that was how that happened. Yeah, amazing that, that you got to do all this stuff, you know, when a label presents an opportunity and that you can do yeah. it. And that's a beautiful yeah. and, and also, as I was fortunate because I live in LA, you know, and and, you know, pretty much if you're in L.A., it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind for people from New York. But Todd remembered me, you know, and wanted me to, and remembered me from when I used to play at the Keystone with Freddie, uh, the Keystone Corner in San Francisco, which he started and owned and run, ran. Mm. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, he remembered me from that, and we always had a good relationship, a good vibe. Um and he uh, asked me to do those those things. Yeah, you mentioned New York now. Like, did you ever? What's your relation to New York? I mean, well, I mean, I think that you can't really. I I believe that you can't really have a serious jazz career without dealing with New York. You know, even if you don't live in New York, sure. you have have some connection to New York, whether it's to the musicians, the industry, management, whatever. It's the, the industry for jazz is there. And yep. there's no question about it. It's kind of, it's the hub, the cultural hub. But although there's a lot going on here in, in Los Angeles too. Um, but if you, but being realistic, if you want to be at least considered in the, uh, you know, in the, in the conversation about jazz, you have to have some relationship with New York. Now, I never actually uprooted and moved to New York, um, but I did have a place there mm. in the early to mid 90s, like from 93 to 96. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I had an apartment um, as well as my house in Los Angeles and Altadena. I also had an apartment in Park Slope with uh, my friend Clayton Cameron. And so I was there much of the time. Mm. Sitting in at Sweet Basil's and playing gigs at the Vanguard. Um, and it was a great time, you know. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm in New York a lot, you know. Yeah. Sure. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much a cultural hub. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, I wanted to, to ask you, Billy, also about your experience. You, you know, 
you've done so much stuff as a band leader and as a sideman, but uh, kind of not so jazzy, but still jazzy. Your experience with Chris Bodie and how, how did that oh, sto yeah. story happen? I mean, that's like really also <laughs> yeah. a different level again of organization. I mean, I, you know, I've spoken with Billy Kilson and he's played with Chris for such a long time yeah. also. And like, right. how did that story begin? Well, um, that happened because um, I did a session with it, the, the producer, Bobby Columbi. Do you know Bobby Columbi? No. He, he started, do you know the group Blood, Sweat, and Tears? Oh, sure, yeah. He started that group. Oh, I, okay, I didn't know that. Okay. He was a drummer, he was like the producer on all those. Okay, didn't associate the name. Okay. Then he turned into like um, an executive at Sony, like way high up, you know, the guy who green lights the major things, the pop things. And he, he, he went into the pop world, you know, as a producer. Um, and it's, it's along the way, he met Chris Bode. Uh, and he, um, I think there was a session um, where Chris played trumpet and Bobby had been wanting me to get together with Chris. Mm. He took a special interest in Chris as a producer. And then later, um, he became Chris's manager for like 20 years and then they recently just parted ways. Oh, really? Oh, well, okay. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's how I connected with Chris. And, you know, I, Chris and I kind of, Chris really liked my playing. And um, I liked his music um, okay, you know. Uh, but but uh, it was, at, at first, the gig was was first of all we had like this incredible musician we had Billy Kilson, yeah, we had James Genus on bass, uh, Mark Whitfield was playing guitar, uh, and um, and there was a singer Jean Jolly who's a really good singer. She lives now I think in North Carolina. Um, uh, she was singing, and then later on it became all these other people. You know, eventually like Lisa Fisher, you know. <laughs> Uh, was a singer, uh, and then, then, but what happened was the, the 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 show. It started out as a jazz show, yeah, essentially, and then as the audience, uh, he started getting really successful. Like, I think he put out an album, and Oprah really liked it. And then he ended up on the Oprah show at the height of when that was popular, and then all of a sudden, yeah, he to the roof. Um, and then he started playing these big like arenas and the music became more like a show, you know, like where you did the same thing over and over and over and over again. Mm. And um, after a while, but then I had a family also. And so sure. the gig was paying really good, but also it was, it was musically rewarding too, in, in some respects, because we got to play like really, play out you know it was kind of a mixed bag it was like um i'm a musician that really likes uh, sponta spontaneity and, mm. and, and to leave things to chance and to see where because that's where i think that the magic happens yeah. um but in this show this was about things being the same and and doing this this kind of like tried and true thing which was going to elicit the kind of response from the audience and after a while I, I started you know departing from that and and we kind of parted ways amicably you know and I still have great respect for him as a as a musician you know and he's a hell of a nice guy too you know yeah. actually um so um yeah I still have great respect for him and and um you know but it was it was it was time to to for us to not yeah, yeah sure I, I know what you mean it's it's yeah for a certain state point you, you can do that but then if you're like you like I, I see you or hear you i mean like an explorer and you you know i think yeah. it's it's hard to stay in that box for a long well, longer time yeah. so. well one thing that it did enable me to do because it was such a successful gig it allowed it allowed me to save up for the projects that i you know, we're doing by myself. Yeah. Uh, sure. And I was still, I still had a pretty successful career 
uh, on the side of like being with Chris Bode. Oh, sure. I'd won a Guggenheim fellowship to, to record my next jazz chamber thing. And all this was happening and going. And plus, Chris gave me a lot of freedom, too. He There's one point where he said, you know, early on, he said, like, take whatever time off you want. And then when you want to come back, just come back. You know? mm. So I, I took a few months and then worked on my... Um, uh, my uh, uh, second uh, jazz, Cham- jazz chamber. chamber, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's it's, it's kind of like a pro and con type of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I can I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did some kind of pop popish acts, but I mean, this is a completely different level. We we're talking about, you know, what you did is the highest level that yeah, I guess yeah. and, you know. and the, the musicianship always was the musicianship musicianship was never compromised sure. in that group. You that's know, so important. It's always at the highest level. Yeah. I mean yeah like, well, you mentioned the guys in the band it's just like yeah uh, it can't get better yeah, almost is, actually a violinist entered the the uh, scene um at a certain point, but always the violinists were like these incredible violinists. In fact, one of the violinists was um, Anne Akiko Myers, uh, who was like this, you know, incredible, like world famous um, violinist who John Corleano has written commissions for, and she's like toured and played at Carnegie Hall and Disney, you know, she's, but this is like one of the violinists. In fact, that's how I met her. I'm writing a piece for the LA Master Chorale with my mm. jazz group and her. And, and I met her through Chris Bode. Oh, Chi Young well. Kim is another one who's like just ridiculously amazing violin soloist. Mm. So mm. the music was always on the highest level. Yeah, that's so, so good, yeah. But Billy, not to take more of your time, I just wanted to ask, you know, you said you're writing new music now, like you recorded this new album with a new band and uh you know what's brewing still this year for the future i mean what, what's your plans well i mean next month i'm going to chicago where where rachel barton pine is going to play my violin concerto mm, uh, the Grand Park orchestra and oh. i just also wrote a string quartet for that earlier this year i wrote a piece for the eastman percussion ensemble which they just killed that piece it was incredible but then for the rest of the year I the remainder of the year I have three like large orchestral pieces that I have to finish man Uh, I'm writing a saxophone concerto how do you do that (laughs) (laughs) where where do you find the time well I I had great teachers you know Um, but yeah I don't know you know I, I I don't know how I'm gonna find the time all of the the um projects that I was confront, confronted with, they were so interesting, I, I just couldn't say no, you know? Um, and so like the saxophone concerto, a piece for wow. a, string, uh, a string orchestra and my jazz chamber ensemble, uh, and then a piece for like big band orchestra and a jazz quintet, you know? Oh, and then next year I'm writing this master chorale piece, you know, so it's it's... It's, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah. That, that, no, no wonder, you, you, you know, making a tour in Europe, that's like almost impossible then in such a schedule. Or Hey, I had to turn down an offer from the LA Opera to, to, write, to write something like a miniature opera. It's something that I, you know, would normally leap at. Yeah. You know, but I was so busy. It was, that's how crazy it's been. I've never had a stretch like this yeah that's good i mean you know it's good it's It's good good, but i need a clone clone. (laughs) but cool but grave i'll I'll leave you to have a nice reminder of the sunday i guess you'll have a nice afternoon now so you can chill oh yeah yeah i'm actually it's father's day and it's also june exactly so. so my sons are taking me to like this a meditation thing that's called a, a sonic oh, what is it called a, a sonic something or other it's like i hear music and meditate or something 
It's a oh, cool wow. thing to do with my sons for, for Father's Day. So That's cool. Nice. To- so you should enjoy it. But th- yeah. thanks so much for taking the time today. And I really appreciate it. It was so nice okay. talking to you and listening to you. And Thanks for um, having me for this. When is it going to... Um... Mm-hmm.